Nearly one-fifth of all the people living in the original 13 colonies were farmers. Most only grew enough food for themselves, their livestock, and to trade locally in nearby villages and towns. But there were some colonists who exported their crops, like corn, wheat, and tobacco, to England and other countries in Europe. British businessmen, who took much of the profit for themselves, usually financed these ventures. After the United States became independent, businesses began to grow, most tied directly to the natural resources of the region where they were located. The Northeast had natural harbors, many rivers, and rich fishing grounds, all of which contributed to economic growth. By the 1800s, in fact, the harnessing of the power of the region's fast-flowing rivers made it the leading manufacturing region in the country. Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and other northeastern cities grew rapidly as millions of immigrants arrived from Europe and other parts of the world. As the demand for goods and services grew along with the population, Small businesses like blacksmith and carpenter shops and grocery and supply stores began to appear. Away from the fast-growing urban areas, the Northeast was a center for fishing and logging, and a place where dairy, fruit, and vegetable farms contributed to the local economy. The southern region of the continent, with its humid, subtropical climate, gave rise to tobacco and rice plantations, which were vital to the region's economy. Tragically, plantation owners also depended on the use of slave labor to make a profit. After the destruction caused by the Civil War, the South had to rebuild its economy. Today, much of the region is agricultural, but centers of research and technology, like the Research Triangle near Raleigh, North Carolina, can also be found here, as well as major media companies like CNN and TNT. In other parts of the South, like Texas and other Gulf region states, the discovery of oil in the 1800s brought new wealth and industry to what had been primarily a cattle ranching area. Finally, the South's temperate climate has made it a popular tourism and retirement region. The Midwest is America's agricultural heartland. Businesses here revolve around today's mega farms, which are among the most productive in the world. The days of the small family-owned farm are fast disappearing with large corporations owning and running today's vast operations. Cities in the Midwest are often linked to agricultural businesses, with thousands of railroad cars carrying livestock and grain to rail hubs in cities like Chicago and St. Louis. Chicago's Mercantile Exchange is the world's busiest market for eggs, hogs, cattle, and other farm products. Midwestern cities are also traditionally centers for manufacturing. Detroit, for example, is home to the automobile industry. The Great Lakes and the Mississippi River are of vital importance for transporting goods in and out of the area. The West has based much of its economic growth and business development on its immense storehouses of oil, natural gas, gold, silver, and copper. In fact, it was the miners' dream of striking it rich that originally attracted settlers to the area. The cities and countryside of the West have always been home to diverse populations. Native Americans and Mexican Americans were joined by settlers from the East and from Asia, all of which are well represented in the fast-growing populations in the area today. The Hollywood film industry in Southern California the computer and technology hubs in San Jose in Northern California and several other Western communities, and internationally renowned tourist destinations like San Francisco, Las Vegas, and Arizona make up a large part of the economy. 
While technology and other factors have reshaped the economies of the various regions of the United States, most are still influenced by their respective natural resources and climate. What are some businesses in your area that still rely on local natural resources? Businesses in the United States are formed in a number of ways. They range from the small, individually owned businesses called sole proprietorships, to businesses that are run by two or more partners called partnerships, to large companies traded on the stock exchange, often with thousands of stockholders as owners. But however large or small, a successful business is usually one that delivers a quality product at a fair and reasonable price. The Eastman Kodak Company, for example, began as a sole proprietorship in the late 1890s when George Eastman introduced his trademark brownie camera that he sold for just one dollar. Today, Kodak is a worldwide corporation which, in addition to selling cameras and film, focuses on the newest digital technologies. Like Kodak, many major corporations are multinational today and have factories and workers all over the world. Cheaper labor costs in other countries have created enormous competition for American workers, a trend that is expected to continue into the foreseeable future. When a business can hire labor at a much cheaper cost, it can sell its products at a much lower price. Besides gaining a competitive advantage, lower costs also translate to higher profits for owners and stockholders. Because of this trend, jeans maker Levi Strauss closed its last two manufacturing facilities in the United States in January of 2004. Since the 1800s, the company had manufactured its famous jeans at locations around the U.S. But now, to compete with other jeans manufacturers, Levi Strauss will build new factories in places like China, where the cost of labor is much lower. Such scenarios are changing the face of business in America. Although large manufacturing corporations remain important, there is today a growing emphasis on small businesses founded by entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have formed many companies to take advantage of the growth and popularity of the Internet, and many of those companies have attracted large amounts of investor dollars by going public and selling stock. Many were formed without the key components needed for business success and soon failed. But some have become extremely successful. Take Yahoo, for example. Yahoo calls itself a network of internet guides. Its users call it a portal or search engine, one of the launching pads from which internet surfers often begin their journeys into cyberspace. One of the most interesting things about this company is how it began as a hobby for a couple of electrical engineering students at Stanford University. David Philo and Jerry Yang call themselves the Chief Yahoos. This is where we started. We were um, both doing our PhD at Stanford, and this is the trailer that we were doing it in. It started as a complete hobby. We were just um, a little bored with our research, and the Internet was a great place to waste time on. Its meaning is, is, is a group of very rude and uncivilized people from Gulliver's Travels, and we thought that's it. Yahoo's mission is to be the one place everyone goes to find anything, connect with anyone, or buy anything. The young entrepreneurs realized from the start that to be all of these things, they first had to be easy to use. By being user-friendly and more dedicated to their consumers than to their advertisers, Yahoo has become the most successful internet search engine in the business. As with all businesses, Yahoo hopes to attract new customers while keeping their existing customers happy. Yahoo provides a good example of American entrepreneurs at work. 
its founders have been able to take advantage of recent trends and to change with the times. What those next trends will be remains to be seen. What are some trends in American business today? As the Internet continues to grow in popularity and buyers gain confidence in online security measures, many more people are shopping online. Historically, consumers do most of their spending during the fourth quarter of the year, in October, November, and December. This trend continues with online purchasing. This chart shows how online shopping has increased both in revenue dollars and as a percentage of all retail sales since 1999 when consumers spent a mere five billion dollars online. Spending rose to nine billion dollars in 2000, nearly eleven billion dollars in 2001. In 2002, fourth quarter shoppers spent almost fourteen billion dollars online. That's 27.6% more than in 2001. 2003 saw a 29% jump from the previous year, with nearly $18 billion circulating online in the fourth quarter. Experts say that online shopping will continue to have a great impact on the economy in the future. If one were to conservatively estimate a 20% increase per year, in the year 2010, online spending would reach over $64 billion. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of shopping online?